Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Paul in chapter 1 was really confronting the Galatians, saying, I I'm shocked, I marvel that you are turning away so quickly, so soon from the gospel, the way that I taught it to you. And somebody's coming to you and deceiving you. And he said, look, I didn't receive this gospel from human beings, but I received this gospel as revelation of G from Jesus Christ. And so this is a pure and precise doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have bought into a perverted version of it, is what he's really saying. So uh, he ends the chapter by making the case that when he got born again and the Lord was teaching them these things, he didn't go to Jerusalem to Peter, James, John, and the other apostles for them to teach him. He said, no, I, I stayed away from Jerusalem uh, for the most part. And God himself, Jesus himself, was teaching me and revealing these things to me. So we pick it up in verse 2, or excuse me, chapter 2, and he said this, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. After 14 years, he said, I spent about 15 days in Jerusalem with Peter and some with James, the Lord's brother. He said, but that's about it. And I, I've been out and the Lord has taught me things. But after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation. I went up and I didn't go there to get revelation. I went up with revelation. I went up by revelation and communicated to them. Listen to this. I communicated to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. I communicated it to them, what the Lord had shown me to preach to the Gentiles. But privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So Titus was Greek, and he was not compelled to be circumcised. So what is Paul saying? Paul's saying that you Galatians, who are Gentiles, I came and taught you that you are saved by faith, through grace. And it's not by works. It's not by keeping the law of the Jewish people or of the Old Testament. No but you're saved by faith. And yet others evidently had come to the churches of Galatia and told them, hey, you guys got to keep the law. You got to keep, of course, the only scriptures they had were what we know as the Old Testament. So they would say, you have to keep the scriptures, right? And so they were looping these Galatian people, these Gentiles in the region of Galatia, they were looping them into living like Jewish people under the law. And even Jewish people can't be saved by keeping the law. But nonetheless, that's what happens. You know, sometimes when I take, uh, I've been to Israel 17 times. And when I take these tours to Israel, uh, some of our folks, you know, you get so excited about the Jewish people, the Jewish traditions, and uh, that they're the covenant people and so on, that it's easy to start wanting to wear things and do things and say things like Jewish people or Jewish believers, Messianic Jews, would do and say and such. However, they come back and it's a little strange, honestly, or a lot to Gentile believers and people wonder, why are you doing this? Well, it's not that it's wrong and I don't ever condemn or forbid people to do those things, but I often do caution people and, uh, and I caution them lest they would think, well, if I do these things, if I wear a prayer shawl, or if I have some tassels uh, going from my pockets or whatever, if I grow my beard a certain way, um, like the Jewish people, or if I, if I speak a little bit more Hebrew in my dialogue, then 
I'm a little more spiritual than the average Christian. I warn them and say, no, that's not true. <laughs> Those kinds of things are not the things that will make things happen for you. Trying to keep the law like a Jew, trying to be circumcised. You know, if people uh, were not Jewish or Catholic or whatever, had the tradition of circumcision, that if you go now and be circumcised, that somehow that you've just gone up a layer in spirituality. Absolutely not the truth. And this is what Paul's saying. These believing Jews likely have come to the churches of Galatia and started telling them, hey, if you really want to be spiritual, if you really want to be right before God, you need to start keeping these Jewish laws. And Paul is confronting that. And so he says here once again, uh, verse 2, and I went up by revelation and communicated to them, that gospel, to the apostles and such at Jerusalem, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who are of reputation, lest by any means I had run, I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me being Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. I was taking Titus to Jerusalem with all these Jewish people, Jewish believers, many of whom think that everybody who gets saved needs to be circumcised and keep the law. He said, not even Titus was compelled to be circumcised. And this occurred because, or this belief that Gentile believers had to be circumcised, this occurred because false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What does that mean? Well, they heard that we're over here in the grace of God, not having to keep the, the letter of the law for salvation. And we have this liberty. And they came in to spy out the liberty. Let's just go see how these guys are doing. Are doing. And they had this intention to kind of subtly come in without coming in as teachers, but just subtly come in, but weave the doctrine in that, you know, if you guys really want to be right, you need to keep the law. And you need to be circumcised. And Paul is saying they came to bring us into bondage because that is a bondage, Paul's saying. Somebody said, well, how could that be a bondage to be obedient to the Old Testament law? Well, because the underlying purpose was to be obedient to the Old Testament law for righteousness, to be saved, to please God. And Paul's saying, yeah, that's the bondage from which Jesus saved us. He saved us from having to keep the law to be saved because nobody could do it anyway. See, so, and notice he called it a bondage that now you have to keep these reg regulations and, and uh, celebrate the feasts of the Lord, the Jewish feast as Gentile believers, etc. He said, now it's, it's enslaving you with something that God never intended for you to be in bondage to. Verse 5, to whom... In other words, talking about these teachers who came and said this, he said, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul said, when I caught on to that, he said, I, I, it wasn't even an hour I was confronting that. Verse 6, but from those who seemed to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. In other words, these were some of these people were esteemed people that were of note, they were of reputation, but Paul said, that didn't impress me. The bottom line is they're not speaking the truth. And so I don't care who they are. I don't care how well known they are. And so they had some kind of a reputation. He said, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism, or excuse me, God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something, added nothing to me. He said, those who uh, had a reputation or they were eloquent and they really seemed like they were going to bring us something good. He said, they didn't add anything to me. I didn't learn anything from them. In other words, anything good that they were saying and right, I already knew it. And uh, whatever I didn't know <laughs> was something that didn't need to be known. It wasn't accurate or helpful. Verse 7, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the circumcised, excuse me, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter for apostleship to the circumcised 
also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, that's the Lord's brother, Cephas and John, or it could have been James, uh, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. And, and when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Okay, so let me put this in perspective here for you. Paul said, and, and this is very possibly when uh, Paul and others were sent from um, Antioch to the church of Jerusalem about this whole matter in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And so there was, the Bible said there was no small dispute among them, but they finally came to agree with the Apostle Paul that the Gentiles did not need to be circumcised and keep the law. So notice, he said, on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel to the uncircumcised was committed to me, as the gospel to the circumcised was to Peter. The apostle Peter was clearly Jesus' number one disciple and apostle. And even in the early church in Jerusalem, he is the most prominent figure, evidently, obviously. Excuse me. The first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, Peter is the most prominent figure. From chapter 13 through the end of the book of Acts, Paul is the most prominent figure. However, Peter was the primary person that in the church, if you wanted to respect somebody, all of the 12 apostles knew, even when they were following Jesus, Peter was the number one disciple. It was always three out of the 12, Peter, James, and John. Never John, James, and Peter. Never James, John, and Peter. No. Always Peter, James, and John. And so uh, he said, when these brothers realized, oh my goodness, just as the Lord Jesus has put Peter as sort of the head of the apostles to the Jewish people, so the Lord Jesus has made Paul sort of the head of all the apostles and those who were sent to the Gentiles. And Paul was the one that was given the revelation of how the Jewish law, which he was well-versed in as a Pharisee, how the Jewish law how the, the Old Testament, as we would now uh, refer to it, related to the Gentiles. That did not come from Peter, James, and John, and the Twelve. That came through Paul. See, and so uh, he said, and so when we were there in Jerusalem, he said, these people, James, Cephas, and John, likely that is James, the Lord's brother. You remember in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, right at the beginning, Herod reached out his hand and killed James, the brother of John. Okay, so uh, by Acts chapter 15, James, the brother of John, had already been martyred. The James that was the prominent one in the church was James, the Lord's brother, who also wrote the book of James, by the way. So James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived uh, the grace that had been given to me, and they gave Barnabas... Uh, me and Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship. In other words, the most prominent three apostles, leaders in the church of Jerusalem, recognize, oh man, this Paul is no joke. Jesus has given him this revelation. And as he speaks, we're realizing what he's saying is true. It's congruent with what uh, we learned from Jesus. And yet it goes much, much deeper and is much, much more thorough. And so they... They welcomed them, and they said, yeah, uh, we, we recognize that the Lord Jesus has called you to go to the Gentiles, and we also recognize that the way that you're approaching the Gentiles with the gospel is precise and accurate. Verse 10, he went on to say, they desired only that we should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. Notice how important helping the poor was to the twelve and to Paul. Verse 11, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face. Now, this is the apostle Peter. This is the number one disciple of Jesus. This is the most uh, respected of all the leaders in the Christian faith in the early church. And guess what? Paul is no slouch. I'm telling you, he knows his stuff. He knows his doctrine. And let me just say, better than Peter did because Paul 
was a Pharisee and, and, and had received this revelation over many years from Jesus, from the word of God. So he said, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Ooh. Verse 12, for before certain men came to James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, or excuse me, now before, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. So when James, the Lord's brother, likely the, the primary pastor leader of the church in Jerusalem, sent some men from Jerusalem up to Antioch, well, Peter had been just eating and fellowshipping with the Gentiles, uh, like, hey, we're brothers in the Lord, and there's no difference between us. However, when these brothers from Jerusalem came, because some of them were still, uh, oh, I was going to say skittish, but not skittish. They, they still believed that the Gentiles were uh, in a class that was lower than them and that they needed to keep the law. So when they came, Peter withdrew and did not eat with those Gentiles as if he wasn't doing it all along. So watch this, because he was fearing those who were of the circumcision, talking about these Jewish leaders that came. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. In other words, Peter wasn't the only one that was there eating with the Gentiles, as they should have, by the way, because they're brothers in the Lord and sisters. And so he said, and the other Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Boy, Paul's just calling everybody out here. Even Barnabas, who another prominent person who is a ministry partner of Paul, that Barnabas also withdrew. And when these people came from Jerusalem, he wouldn't eat with those Gentile brothers either. Watch this, verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, what does that mean? That the truth of the gospel is, look, if they are born again and we are born again, then we are one. And just because they're not Jews and don't keep the law, that doesn't mean that we can't sit down as brothers in the Lord uh, on equal levels, saved by the grace of God and eat in fellowship together. He said, and when you start to act like, first of all, like you don't do it when the Jewish people from Jerusalem are not around because they do it. And second, when you're not straightforward about the fact that it's appropriate for us to eat in fellowship as brothers of the Lord. He said, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews. In other words, if, if you're there fellowship with the Gentiles and not doing all the things that Jews do, eating with the Gentiles and eating like the Gentiles. He said, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Like when these brethren come from Jerusalem and now you're trying to get these Gentiles to adopt these Jewish laws or traditions. He's saying, why are you doing that? You weren't even doing that before these men came. Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So just because the Jewish believers are keeping the law of Moses in faith, not for salvation, no, but because they were given that law, the law of Moses, to the Jewish people. See, and so not to be saved, but being saved, they're still keeping to the law and the customs of Jews. So he's saying, but even we don't get justified by doing that. So why are you going to try to strap that on the Gentiles? Because we're not justified by the law. God forbid that they could ever be justified by the law. They were not even raised with this. They don't even understand it all. It's not even a part of their culture. See verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? See, he's saying, if 
if we're trying to keep the law to be forgiven, to be saved, to measure up to God, then we're going to be found sinners because we can't keep the law. There's no way. He said, uh, therefore, is Christ a minister of sin? So if we're going to try to strap this same law on the Gentiles that cannot justify us, then is that the will of God? Is that what Jesus wants us to do? And if so, is he a minister of sin? He's helping everybody to uh, see their sin and to sin more by you know, breaking all these commandments that we strapped on to people. Verse 18, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, when I came to these Gentiles, uh, anybody that had the idea that they had to measure up and be good enough to be saved, he said, I took the doctrine of grace and I, I chopped all of that stuff down and helped everybody to realize, yes, you need to be obedient, but first you need to receive the grace of Jesus for salvation, washing you from your sins. And then having been washed, having received the grace of God, having received the free gift of righteousness, now begin to be obedient to God out of love and honor for him. He said, so I already broke all that down. He said, if I start building back up all of these faulty doctrines of trying to measure up with obedience to salvation, he said, then I'm a transgressor because I'm coming and destroying the very gospel of grace that I brought. Verse 19, for I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. For I through the law, I died. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. I know the law. He said, but I had to die to the law that I might live unto God. Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. How did he die to the law? Watch. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is such a powerful verse. It is one of my favorite verses in all of the New Testament. So notice what it says. I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for himself. He died for us. So to be saved, we have to recognize that that was really us on the cross. That was our sin on the cross. So therefore, the old person, the sinner that was born of a baby, that old life, that old person that was a sinner, that person died. That person died on the cross. We're supposed to recognize, somebody says, is that pretending? Well, I guess you could say pretending, but pretending would be short in this way, that in God's heart and mind, God really, really, really did credit the death of Jesus as the death of your old sinful person. So it's not really pretending as much as it is recognizing or acknowledging that when you put your faith in Jesus, that old person that you were, that was a sinner, that person's dead. And so you acknowledge and recognize that in the heart and mind of God, that person died on the cross. So I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul said, look, when I put my faith in Jesus, I I've discovered that I was crucified on the cross with Christ. Praise God. So now this life that I'm now living in the flesh is not my old life. Even though I may think I still have my old mind, my old thoughts, I still have my same body. Yeah, but we have to recognize that spiritually a reality took place and that old person's gone. And so this person, we have to tell our person, you're a new person. You are a new person in Christ Jesus. And now the life that you now have, you are a life to live unto God. You are like Jesus here on the earth to do whatever the will of God is. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So just like I'm giving myself my life to God, well, Jesus gave his life for me. Verse 22, I do not set aside the grace of God, 
For if righteousness comes through the law or trying to obey the law, then Christ died in vain. If righteousness comes through the law, then Jesus didn't need to die. I just need to be obedient. He said, no, righteousness doesn't come that way. Nobody can be righteous that way. Jesus had to die. And so if he had to die, then you need to die and then live unto God through grace, by faith, not having to measure up for salvation, receiving salvation freely by the grace of Jesus, and then having received it, then you're obedient to God out of love and honor for what he has done for you. Okay, praise God. I'm telling you, this is some beautiful and precise doctrine that Paul is laying down that Peter says in one of his epistles, man, some of that stuff that Paul writes is hard to understand, even for Peter and the apostles, because he just gets deep into these layers. But thank God the Holy Spirit is revealing them to us so that we can understand. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow for uh, an amazing chapter. Do not miss Galatians chapter 3.